says it's seven o'clock. So today's Grand Rounds is, is to be presented by Dr. Harbrecht, and I, I did just want to say a couple of words in, in introduction to Brian. Uh, for, for residents and students and anyone else who doesn't know, Dr. Herbrick did his surgical training here. He was an outstanding resident. His uh, father, uh, some of you may or may not know, I know a few of the older people like myself and, and Dr. Polk who were senior and around at that time, uh, really uh, were, were uh, uh, blessed, I, I'd say, in my case, to uh, to know his dad, uh, Philip Herbrick, who was the uh, Chief of Surgery at the VA for many years. Brian then did some work in, in research at Pittsburgh before joining their faculty there, uh, where he rose, I think, to be Chief of Trauma, as I understand it, but certainly was very, very active in their trauma program. We we had a couple of uh, missteps along the way um, uh, uh, in, in terms of our trauma program, uh, which was very unusual, and we were able to recruit Brian back and he did an excellent job in, in getting those uh, things in order, getting the faculty uh, recruited back up. And uh, one of the things I wanted to say about today's topic, to me, the most influential paper and the best paper I've ever read about splenic injury, and it's, a, it's a, been an interest of mine for a long time, was a paper that Dr. Harbrecht was the primary author, which was uh, uh, the Eastern Association of Surgery Trial. I believe that's where it was uh, the group, I think, Brian, correct me if I'm wrong later, um, but uh, multi multi institutional experience that was reported that really uh, so it's a bit a few years ago. He'll probably comment on it, but but I think was the best paper I've ever seen written about splenic injuries because it did show that you still need to operate on some splenic things at a time when the prevailing wisdom seemed to be, if you read the literature, that you never had to operate on a splenic injury. So he's been extraordinarily influential. Uh, nationwide and worldwide, really, in the management of those problems. So we really appreciate his uh, willingness to uh, share those thoughts with us today. So thank you, Brian. My pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Richardson. So for the, the House staff, just a couple of objectives. Uh, I want you all to understand the priorities in management with, of splenic injuries. We're going to discuss uh, in fair amount of detail the role of operative versus non-operative management and try to dissect at least a little bit on a superficial level the role of angiographic embolization. Since that uh, continues to be a very prominent topic in the field, um, we do it some, we don't do it a ton, don't do it as much as some institutions do, and we'll touch on a little bit about the where's and why's about that. Um, one couple of things that are really not going to be discussed. Uh, I'm not going to talk about pediatric splenic injuries. Pediatric surgeons like to mention that uh, children are not small adults, and that's entirely true, especially with respect to splenic injuries. Uh, kids are not going to get all liquored up at the bar, get on their motorcycle, ride at 100 miles an hour, and then get go hit a deer. Uh, and their injury mechanisms are different. Their force vectors are different. Uh, and the converse is also true, uh, adults are not large kids. And so uh, for those of you who rotate on the pediatric surgery service, you cannot take what you learn about splenic injuries uh, primarily based upon children and apply that to adults. Adults don't take a joke the way kids do, and so a lot of those things are not, not relevant to adult splenic injuries. I'm not going to talk about the role of a laparoscopic or robotic splenectomy in the management of a traumatic splenic injury. So for those of you who may have tuned in to get the latest on a technological debate, you can go ahead and mute me now because we're not going to discuss that. And we're really not going to talk about the surgical technique because what most people end up having uh, uh, learning issues with or uh, other types of things is usually not the, the, the way to take a spleen out. It's the it's all the decision making that goes into uh, doing that prior to the time. There's been a long history of trauma at the University of Louisville. For those of you all who are new to the new to the program and have just started, this is a picture of the old Louisville General, which is where the trauma service uh, at the University of Louisville started in around 1913 or so. Um, and the department has been very active in uh, uh, the field. Uh, the paper by Dr. Richardson and Malangoni at the top there, um, back around 1990, was one of the first to talk about uh, using computed CT uh, in the diagnosis of splenic injuries. Uh, also 
provided some useful information about grading that we'll talk about later. Uh, for any of the residents who have not yet read uh, Dr. Richardson's Scudder Oration, um, uh, it's worthwhile and the citation is listed there below. Uh, the Scudder Oration is uh, one of the primary named lectures at the American College of Surgeons meeting every fall. It's probably the most prestigious lecture given in the field of trauma at uh, that meeting, if not uh, in the field. Uh, and uh, if you haven't read that, you should because it's chock full of lots of useful information uh, and everybody ought to have that committed to memory. The management of, the, of injuries and trauma basically uh, was all compiled into a book uh, on, uh, that was largely uh, reflective of the way that trauma care was done at the old Louisville General and the, the University Hospital and came out in the 80s and again, you can still dust off uh, the cover and find some of these in the library for those of you all who uh, still like a physical textbook rather than electronic. But the uh, one of the primary take home messages is that the diagnostic modalities and the treatment modalities have largely paralleled uh, each other, uh, primarily based upon some of the limitations of what we know uh, in terms of being able to identify splenic injuries. Uh, in the pre-modern era, prior to the advent of uh, surgical techniques and anesthesia that Dr. Cheadle had talked about last week in his hist history on surgery talk, uh, there really was not any sp specific treatment for splenic injuries because people really didn't know they existed. Uh, unless you had a, had a, a flank stab wound that caused your spleen to basically eviscerate, uh, most people did not know that they had a splenic injury uh, and so those went undetected. Once surgical techniques were developed, uh, the basic modality for diagnosing splenic injuries was largely a physical exam. Uh, X-rays were primitive, uh, and so you were basically looking for uh, the presence or absence of signs of significant trauma and shock. And so in that era, up probably until, uh, for most of the uh, uh, 1900s, uh, the uh, main splenic injuries that were identified were the ones that were severe enough to cause shock, and therefore splenectomy was the primary treatment. This is also uh, one of the primary reasons why, uh, again, up until uh, for most of the 1900s, uh, the, the teaching tenant was that any splenic injury needed to be treated with splenectomy. Again, that was largely because the only splenic injuries that they saw were likely ma major ones that were causing shock. Uh, in the mid-1960s, uh, diagnostic peritoneal lavage was developed, rapidly was expanded, uh, and you came to the era where people were getting exploratory laparotomy based upon the detection of a small amount of blood in the peritoneal cavity. Oftentimes, injuries had stopped the bleeding by the time people had explored them, uh, and so the era of splenography or splenic repair uh, became very prominent because people were now operating and detecting uh, blood in the peritoneal cavity from relatively minor injuries. And then computed tom tomography or CT scanning uh, became uh, more prominent in the late 80s, probably more so in the 90s. Uh, and this ushered in the era of non-operative management and, and uh, was sort of a pendulum swing going from operating on all splenic injuries uh, to operating on no splenic injuries to trying to decide which splenic injuries needed to be operated on and which ones didn't. And you can see that the, the, uh, uh, the field of splenic injuries that people see in hospitals has been changing over time. This is a 15-year study taken from a state database. Uh, this was done in, in, out of Pennsylvania when I was up in Pittsburgh. Uh, with the grade of splenic injuries uh, listed on the right uh, using ICD-9 codes, which sort of correlates crudely with severity, uh, but you can see that over time in yellow, the number of splenic injuries gradually increased over this 15-year time period, corresponding to a gradual uh, <clears throat> and widespread proliferation of CT scanning for diagnosis over the same time period. You can also see that the number of minor splenic injuries in sort of the aqua colored uh, and the number of major splenic injuries in red uh, basically stayed the same throughout that time frame. But what you really saw was a widespread identification of lots of uh, uh, relatively minor splenic injuries in the purple color, uh, 
uh, again, largely driven by uh, more widespread ad spread adoption and, and utilization of uh, CT scans for diagnosis in all kinds of uh, injury mechanisms. And you can see the same thing um, uh, if you look at the National Trauma Data Bank. This is data, or these are data that uh, Greg Watson, uh, one of my colleagues who was a resident in Pittsburgh, uh, identified at the time. Uh, and you can see the exact same thing uh, from uh, across the country where the, the, the total number of injuries increased uh, largely driven by that, that population of relatively minor splenic injuries uh, seen in red, uh, which largely probably parallels why non-operative management was so successful for most of the time. You were, you were seeing and identifying relatively minor injuries that could readily be treated non-operatively with more uh, uh, frequent CT scanning of, of injury victims. If you look at the mortality uh, over that same time frame, uh, the mortality of the minor injuries really stayed about the same. Uh, most of these people would have died uh, from associated injuries like brain injuries or pelvic fractures or things like that. Interestingly enough, the mortality from the severe injuries in red uh, also really did not change over that time frame. But the mortality for all splenic injuries over that time frame gradually decreased, uh, as listed in yellow there, which which uh, nearly paralleled completely uh, the identification and mortality of all these low-grade injuries that were being identified with more frequent use of CT scanning as, again, CT scanning permeated not only from inner cities to small rural, rural hospitals uh, and became more and more common for diagnosis. And I suspect that if we track those same curves out uh, you'd see, uh, again, a continued ongoing increase uh, uh, over time. And so non-operative management became the most common form of blunt splenic injuries, uh, and it's not too terribly surprising. Um, CT scanning was becoming more and more utilized, uh, and you're identifying more and more low-magnitude, low-grade splenic injuries that would be amenable and successful to non-operative management. Many of these likely would have been successful with non-operative management if you had never detected them before, uh, but, but they were being detected and uh, uh, able, and they populated uh, people's databases, hospitals, and things like that. These were associated, again, with uh, low-velocity accidents, uh, as, as many of the residents uh, can see in their own personal experience. Uh, any Tom, Dick, and Harry who happens to stumble and fall is is highly likely to get a CT scan as part of their diagnostic workup. Uh, and uh, uh, um, very few of the, the, these were because there were more motor vehicle crashes. Again, it was not an necessarily a dramatic increase in the number of injured people as much as it was uh, utilization of technology to detect uh, injuries in people who might not have gotten uh, imaged before. And there was also an overall or a parallel decrease in the number of uh, magnitude of injuries, associated injuries, uh, uh, and again, accompanying injuries, a lot more isolated splenic injuries. When, you're, when you are uh, faced with a splenic injury, though, the key question for the house staff uh, is basically, is the splenic injury actively bleeding? Uh, as a corollary to that, is it likely to bleed in the, the near future? And as a separate uh, a question, um, is this going to be unlikely to bleed for uh, eternity until it heals, or are there some other components uh, that need to be factored in? And again, we're going to be talking about adults. We're not going to be talking about kids. And this is blood splenic injuries only because your algorithm uh, for uh, identifying and managing penetrating trauma uh, should be vastly different than what we're going to talk about in terms of managing blunt injuries. So why do patients fail at attempts of non-operative management? Uh, this touches on some of the information that Dr. Richardson mentioned from uh, uh, the EAST study uh, that was largely driven by my senior, senior partner, Dr. Andrew Peitzman at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, uh, and uh, the thing that we discovered or that he discovered uh, was that, again, undiagnosed bleeding uh, was the most common uh, in the area where people were starting to do, learning to do, and trying to refine uh, non-operative management in the early 2000s. Uh, 
Uh, and so uh, uh, calling a patient, quote unquote, stable when they were uh, having a heart rate of 125 to 130 uh, and had signs and symptoms of ongoing bleeding uh, was uh, relatively common. You do have patients who can temporarily tamponade their splenic injuries and might end up having delayed bleeding. Uh, the delayed splenic rupture that people talk about most frequently had been delayed diagnosis of a splenic injury or de delayed diagnosis of bleeding. Uh, but there is a small population of patients who can potentially tamponade and then uh, end up having a bleeding problem 48 or 72 hours later or even uh, longer than that. And some of that is thought to be due to progression of vascular injuries, uh, delayed presentations of uh, parenchymal pseudoaneurysms that can exist, or the development of a subcapsular hematoma that then goes on to rupture uh, later on in the course. And so it's been shown in lots of different studies that the risk of splenectomy after hospital discharge is low, uh, but it's not zero, and it's unlikely that we'll ever drive it down to zero although it's probably 1% uh, or less. So when you're talking about how to pick who you're gonna manage operatively or non-operatively in adults with blunt splenic injuries, again, at the top of the list is what people call hemodynamic stability. Uh, really, uh, in my opinion, that's a completely lousy term. Uh, hemodynamically stable uh, is somewhat in the eye of the beholder. And so a hemodynamic status or normality is probably a more preferable way to think of, preferable way to think about somebody's hemodynamic status. Stable can be somebody's got a heart rate of 130 for six straight hours. Uh, that doesn't change. That's not that's stable, uh, but it certainly doesn't indicate uh, normality and can be indicative of volume loss and blood loss. Certainly, the overall magnitude of injuries uh, correlates uh, with uh, a success or failure of non-operative management. Uh, your brain injury and your pelvic injury may not necessarily impact uh, how you manage the splenic injury itself, but uh, those other injuries are a, a correlate for the magnitude of force uh, that goes into the injury, and certainly somebody who falls off a three-story building is far more likely to have a severe splenic injury than somebody who just tripped and fell from standing. Uh, and so those also may complicate management uh, because it may be very challenging to determine if somebody's got blood loss from their splenic injury or do they have blood loss from their pelvic fracture, their femur fracture, and, and associated injuries. Certainly grade of splenic injury correlates very well with uh, ability to manage uh, uh, a splenic injury operatively or non-operatively. We'll talk about some of the, the problems with that, uh, but all the residents should get used to trying to apply a grading system so that you can talk about uh, that, at least in terms of estimating the magnitude of the splenic injury. One of the findings in the EAST study that Dr. Peitzman identified was that the quantity of hemoperitoneum is associated uh, with the success or failure of non-operative management. Uh, that does not necessarily uh, uh, equate directly, uh, but certainly uh, somebody who's got a large quantity of hemoperitoneum and has bled a lot, but by the time they get their CAT scan, uh, certainly is going to be at greater risk for ongoing bleeding than somebody who's got what the radiology tells you is a grade four splenic injury, but doesn't have a single drop of blood anywhere in their peritoneal cavity that you can see. Age and comorbidities uh, also uh, are associated with success or failure. Uh, sometimes that's related to medications. Certainly people on antiplatelet agents, anticoagulants uh, can be very complex. And uh, the comorbidities, uh, again, may not impact the magnitude of the splenic injury per se, but certainly are gonna influence uh, the ability of your patient to uh, tolerate uh, hypotension, uh, tolerate uh, acidosis, uh, and uh, tolerate uh, an injury overall, and so it needs to be factored in. This is a mock-up of uh, uh, probably the most common grading scale uh, used, which is the AAST grading scale. For the house staff, you can go to the AAST, you can download this as a PDF, you can put it on your peripheral, peripheral brain and stick it in your phone and refer to it whenever you need to. Uh, 
because again, sometimes the grading systems that other people use are uh, unknown, basically. Uh, and so when a radiologist tells you that there's a grade three injury, it's hard to know exactly what that means because you don't necessarily know what grading system they're utilizing. This grading system was developed for the operative management of splenic injuries back in the day when, uh, again, splenography and splenectomies were uh, probably equally common. It's been applied to the utilization of CT scans. Uh, whether it directly translates or not is something we can discuss in greater detail, but again, it was primarily developed for the operative, uh, intraoperative decision making, uh, although it does, uh, uh, again, has been applied to uh, uh, CT and probably is preferable to the era when every radiologist kind of used their own grading scale. This is out of Dr. Malangoni's paper, uh, where again, they compared operative to CT grades. Uh, and you can see, uh, again, that the, um, uh, the CT grade or the, based on AAST um, is basically an estimate of uh, magnitude of splenic injury. They showed that the CT grade can uh, overestimate or underestimate the true magnitude of the injury as defined by operative uh, exploration by as much as a grade. So again, it's important to keep in mind the principle that the CT grade is uh, basically an estimate of uh, uh, what the actual findings will be at uh, operative management. Several years ago, uh, a group published this particular study where they tried to correlate grading uh, based upon who was doing the grading uh, and uh, showed uh, a set of CT scans to several radiologists and several trauma surgeons. Uh, and as you can see, uh, e even when they tried to apply the AAST grading system, uh, there was a whole lot of variability and the grades that were applied were frequently all over the board, um, depending upon who was doing the actual interpretation. And so again, when you're talking about what uh, some of our colleagues do or what comes from an outlying hospital, uh, you, you may not know what system they were using. Oftentimes, some people look like they use the system of, well, it looks really bad, it's probably a grade five, doesn't look so bad, I'm gonna call it a grade one. Somewhere in between, I'm gonna call it a grade three. Uh, but again, this emphasizes that you really need to look at your own studies and do your own estimation so you can determine uh, how significant or insignificant that splenic injury is. Grade does correlate with the uh, success of a, uh, your ability to manage somebody non-operatively. Uh, this is a paper, uh, this is a graph taken from that East paper, uh, Dr. Peitzman's, uh, and uh, uh, you have uh, uh, the failure rate basically on the left, and you can see that the failure rate of non-operative management uh, correlates quite well with the grade of injury, with high-grade injuries much more likely to fail uh, attempts at non-operative management than low-grade injuries. The grade also correlates with the um, uh, associated injuries, um, and that also a, a, a trend tracks with your ability to manage somebody operatively or non-operatively. This is uh, taken out of a, a, a large state database. Uh, it, it was originally designed to compare level one and level two traumas in a state uh, systems in, or hospitals in a state. But it does uh, demonstrate that uh, the associated injuries for folks who basically go straight to the operating room uh, to have their splenic injury managed uh, on the far left of those two columns is, is uh, pretty significant. Uh, they're all uh, uh, typically uh, quite severely injured. Uh, the, the overall injury magnitude from associated injuries is much less in those people who are able to be managed successfully non-operatively. Uh, and it, this also illustrates that those who failed non-operative management, at least in terms of associated injuries, were much more similar to the people who went straight to the operating room from the emergency department uh, than those who were able to ma be managed non-operatively. Again, suggesting that there you know, are some opportunities for refinement in decision-making, since those patients clearly appear to be somewhat different. 
Out of that same uh, EAST database, uh, we looked at age uh, to see if age was a factor because there was a lot of back and forth about uh, doing non-operative management in adults, how old was too old to be able to try to do non-operative management. Uh, and so we broke down these according to age. Uh, we used the age convention of 55 years, uh, which had been done in several papers before. I'm not sure that, again, the concrete age or the age of 55 is the key uh, as much it is, as it is the principle of uh, trying to manage older folks. You can see, again, even in uh, older adults uh, who are greater than 55 years, you can still frequently successfully manage them non-operatively. Uh, the rate was somewhat less than it was in the younger patients, but it was still pretty substantial, upwards of 80%, even in that older time. It was associated, though, uh, older folks had a higher mortality. As you can see, the numbers above the columns are the mortalities for each group. You can also see that for older folks, they failed non-operative management more commonly. And for both groups of any group, the mortality rate associated with failed non-operative management was much higher than it was for those who were managed successfully. Uh, and that, that uh, mortality difference was most pronounced uh, in the adult, older patients, which again is not surprising uh, because many of those patients are going to have me medical comorbidities uh, that are going to impact their outcome. But it does suggest that uh, if you are doing a better job of identifying shock and hypotension, uh, that older patient is going to be managed better. Uh, when I when I got here, uh, and, and as we were uh, 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 managing things, the philosophy was sort of seemed to be, well, you know, we're taking out all these splenic injuries, and all we do is operate, and nobody else operates, but we do. Uh, and so uh, I looked at our experience here. These are this is over an 18 month time frame. You can see the time frame at the top to see whether we were exactly uh, different or similar to what other people were doing in terms of operative or non-operative management. And you can see just over that 18-month representative period, uh, the number of patients who went to the operating room straight from the emergency department was about 37 was 37 percent. Uh, and in most of the series, when you look at it, if you dissect their numbers out carefully, uh, they oftentimes take those patients off the top uh, but the number of patients who typically go straight to the operating room with the emergency department, even in those people who are basically making you feel guilty for ever operating on a spleen, uh, is usually somewhere between 30 and 40 percent. So our experience was really not that different numerically than uh, what you saw a lot of other people publish. When you looked at our uh, of success or failure of non-operative management for the people that we intended to manage non-operatively, it was uh, close to 94%, which is certainly uh, respectable and um, on par with what you see across the country. When you look at our outcomes or our mortality in that sample of patients, again, our mortality for people going straight to the operating room was actually somewhat lower than a couple of large national series. Uh, our mortality was around 11%. In that East paper that uh, Dr. Peitzman did, it was almost 26%. And in the paper that uh, Dr. Smith did when he was a resident at Ohio State, it was around 20%. Mortality in those who were managed successfully non-operatively, again, largely due to things like uh, brain injury or uh, uh, respiratory failure or comorbidities, again, for us was around 5%, which was on par uh, with what other people were seeing. And our mortality for those who failed non-operative management was around uh, 12 or 13%. Again, very similar, suggesting that our experience really wasn't fundamentally different than what uh, a lot of people were doing. And so some of it is just how you talk about it or how you approach it. So what should you do with uh, high-grade splenic injuries, particularly in light of the fact that as uh, CT scans have become more commonly utilized, even at very, very tiny hospitals, you're identifying far more low-grade injuries to manage and that the high-grade injuries, the ones that really test your decision-making uh, capabilities, are proportionally less common uh, since, the, since basically the market has been flooded with low-grade injuries. 
some great uh, high grade in, higher grade injuries can definitely be managed non operatively but how do you just how do you decide which ones not only which ones can be managed non operatively but probably which ones should be managed non operatively is a is a different way to phrase the question and there is a price associated with failure if you choose wrong and your patient continues to bleed or if your patient has a, a problem later and you you have somebody who's been bleeding uh, uh, but not identified, uh, there is a real morbidity and mortality associated with that. One of the huge problems is that in the field, people had, had uh, loved to use historical controls comparing uh, their treatment mo modality now with their treatment modality before. Uh, the problem is that everybody's getting better at non-operative management over time, and so it's very difficult to tell whether your direct therapy now really correlates to what you were doing eight years ago, again, because of some of those demographics we've talked about. And whether you include those patients taken to the operating room or not in your discussion uh, varies from publication to publication. And then finally, does angiography have an impact? Does angiography make it better? Is angiography going to revolutionize the field so that you never have to operate on a splenic injury again? <clears throat> and so we'll delve into that a little bit just because, again, this was a uh, a very hot topic in the uh, 2010 to 2015 range, uh, probably less so now that some of the dust has settled from a lot of it. Uh, it still gets uh, a surprisingly disproportionate amount of attention for, for some things because, again, in things like the uh, National uh, Trauma Quality Improvement Program database, uh, they still want everybody to talk about how many splenic injuries you embolized or operated on and so uh, again it's worthwhile talking about that. A plethora of studies uh, in the uh, uh, mid-2000s talking about how angiography could potentially uh, improve splenic salvage rates uh, where they had splenic you know rates of success of salvage of around uh, upper 80s to 90s. Again if you look at the the, if you remember the graph that I showed you, our own success rate was about 94% uh, when you intentionally tried to treat somebody non-operatively, and so you're trying to improve that uh, significantly uh, is going to be a challenge when you're only talking about a, a couple, couple percent ranges. Uh, but again, there were lots of issues with all of these studies, primarily because they were, they were looking at historical controls uh, where the number of low-grade injuries uh, that are naturally able to be managed non-operatively was much less. And so, again, most of these were done uh, ad hoc. Some of these had fairly significant complication rates for angiography. Uh, and so uh, it was very difficult to be able to uh, uh, really put those uh, reports into perspective in terms of what is going to be applicable to what what you are seeing as a, as a trauma surgeon or a resident rotating on the trauma service. When I was at Pittsburgh, we looked at our own experience with angiography to try to really dissect out whether it made a difference in improving non-operative salvage rate. Uh, and so in, in our experience over a several year period, we had uh, 570 patients Again, about 30 to 40 percent of them went straight to the operating room and did not even get an attempt at non-operative management, and so don't really count. So in the remaining patients who did uh, attempt non-operative management, uh, we had uh, 46 that underwent angiography, and uh, better than half of those had underwent embolization. Uh, and so we decided to look at our, our experience retrospectively. Uh, this, this study can be criticized because there was no formal protocol for doing angiography. It was at the discretion of the attending surgeon. Uh, that threshold uh, uh, varied amongst the different attendings. Uh, and the experience also varied over time, as you can see here. Some years it, there was a quite robust experience, others less so. Most of the people who underwent angiography in our retrospective series uh, had moderate grade splenic injuries. Most of them were grade threes and fours. I think there was one grade five, if I remember correctly. There were also a smattering of low grade injuries, uh, grade two, uh, which kind of makes you wonder why those folks were getting angiography. But if you broke those uh, 
uh, groups down according to grade and compared your ability to manage them non-operatively based upon the grade, um, you know, you could see that there was really no difference, at least in the way that we utilized angiography in Pittsburgh, in improving non-operative success rate. Not only uh, in the grade twos, who you're going to have a good success rate anyway, uh, but in the higher grade injuries. And again, in full disclosure, there were very few grade fives uh, that uh, we really intentionally managed uh, non-operatively. There, there was a, maybe a small spattering. Most of these were grade threes and fours, but really angiography did nothing to improve the success rate for that group. What about other people? Have they had better success rate than, uh, than we did? Again, uh, uh, experience published in 2009 uh, where they used contrast extravasation or the presence of pseudoaneurysms as an indication for angiography and tried to do their angiography uh, within 12 hours of presentation. Uh, again, these some of these were done pseudo-electively uh, the following morning, so they didn't tax their radiologists and make them come in at midnight to embolize a, you know, a hemodynamically stable grade three injury. Uh, and so you can see here that in, when they compared their data to historical controls, uh, they had a much uh, a greater experience or a gradually increasing experience of uh, utilization of angiography and embolization uh, down there where they were doing it uh, in that most recent period almost a third of the time of their patients. And they showed again that their success rate uh, for non-operative management was improving over time. Again, I would postulate that a lot of that is due to uh, 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 changes in the demographics that they're seeing. And you can see certainly that the overall magnitude of injury based or, or uh, uh, measured by ISS had dramatically declined uh, over time in that group. They, they, their splint grades really were fairly moderate uh, uh, based upon AISs. Uh, and so, uh, again, their success rate uh, for being able to manage non-operatively uh, uh, when they had gradually increasing uh, utilization was, was decent. Uh, but it's worth pointing out that when they went from about uh, a lower percentage up to almost a third, uh, their success rate for non-operative management uh, really did not dramatically improve. And their mortality rate uh, associated with non-operative management really did not improve over those two most recent time frames, uh, even though there was a dramatic increase in the utilization of angiography and embolization. Again, those two time frames also were associated with a, a decrease in uh, overall injury magnitude as measured by ISS, but it really did not improve their ability to manage their patients uh, non-operatively. Probably the one who's uh, 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 at least most rigorously uh, addressed this question uh, were the folks at Wake Forest where they protocolized uh, utilization of angiography and embolization for all of their patients where uh, they took anybody with a grade three to five injury that they were attempting to manage non-operatively and subjected all of them to angiography. Again, whether they were embolized was at the discretion of the interventional radiologist uh, and a lot of these sound like they were done the next day uh, in sort of a semi-elective manner uh, as opposed to in the middle of the night as an emergency to uh, uh, <clears throat> stop bleeding, which again, uh, I think is a prudent uh, angiography is, is, in these kinds of tools is, should probably not be thought of as a tool to stop bleeding. Uh, but trying to improve your ability to, uh, to manage somebody non-operatively. Again, they also use sort of historical controls comparing their decade of protocolized angiography uh, on the right to their uh, uh, period of time where they were not doing it protocolized on the left. Uh, <clears throat> you can see uh, that uh, their mortality associated with splenic injuries improved, uh, but their ISS has also decreased over time. When you dig down and look at their numbers, uh, again, uh, even though they talk about doing these on grade three to five injuries, really the vast majority of the injuries that they were treating uh, were grade three injuries, 
which in and of themselves have a fairly decent uh, success rate for non-operative management. And very, very few of these were grade five. And they did show some improvements in their ability to manage these folks non-operatively, but you really did not get a lot of information about uh, what the ISS of these patients was individually based upon their grade, what the mechanism of injuries were. There was no information about how long these folks stayed in the hospital, whether these folks got blood transfusions uh, or things like that. And so, again, if you just looked at the non-operative rate, uh, it was pretty decent. Uh, but whether it was truly affected by uh, angiography or embolization uh, still was somewhat of an open question. Uh, ben Zarzur, uh, who was formerly at Memphis, then in Indianapolis, now I don't know where he is, uh, looked at a, a number of trauma centers uh, nationally, looked at the utilization of uh, uh, angiography and embolization across uh, a large number of high uh, 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 centers to see if that affected things. When they, uh, they define failure as anybody who got operated on after 24 hours, uh, and uh, he identified that there was a, a, a reasonable rate of angiography and embolization, but uh, almost 20% uh, of the people ended up needing repeat angiography for failure, the first one. The splenectomy rate after angiography and embolization was uh, still uh, fairly consequential, and there was really no difference in uh, long-term salvage rates uh, of these patients, whether angiography and embolization was performed or not. Uh, you know, there was a, uh, one trauma surgeon who said that non-operative management should be preferred because the risks of splenectomy are substantial. So if we're gonna figure out whether non-operative management should be done, it helps us to understand what really are the risks of a splenectomy uh, in an injured patient. And these are sort of the compendium of uh, publications that looked at infection rates uh, after splenectomy. Uh, back in the 80s, Dr. Fry, and then as recently as uh, 2012, Dr. Nash's mentor, Dr. Dimitriades, uh, who basically said that uh, the infection rate after splenectomy was extremely high and should never be done. Uh, you know, their true infections rates, when you break them down, are listed here in the table. And so some of these are going to be directly related to the splenectomy, uh, but many of these, including pneumonia, bacteremia, urinary tract infections, I mean, some of these may just simply be the consequences of taking care of people who are badly hurt, whether they get a splenectomy or not. In that 18-month subset of patients that we looked at, you can see our um, uh, risks of infection from a variety of different things are listed there in the column to the right. Uh, but again, uh, you know, how do you know in the patient who got a splenectomy, who's also got a pelvic fracture and a flail chest, whether that pneumonia is due to their flail chest or due to their splenectomy? When we broke this down and looked at a subset of people who had isolated splenic injuries and got a splenectomy on the far right column, uh, you can see that the risk of infectious complications after their splenectomy or technical complications, again, at least in this data set, uh, was quite low. And so uh, we looked at this again in a bit more detail with a couple of enterprising residents uh, to try to determine whether infectious complications were really due uh, to the splenectomy uh, in patients who underwent it or whether they were due to their associated injuries. And again, we broke these down into people who ended up getting splenectomies because of multiple trauma, isolated trauma, or never got a splenectomy at all. <clears throat> and the demographics are there, they're fairly similar. Uh, you can see the ISS scores there and the, and the injuries. Most of the people, again, who got a splenectomy had a high-grade injury. There was a, uh, a fairly substantial uh, uh, proportion of these patients who had uh, significant brain injuries, as measured by Glasgow Coma Score, as you can see. Larger numbers of them were intubated, requiring blood transfusions. Uh, and a substantial number of them ended up in infections in the, in the uh, multiply injured patients. However, again, those who were, were successfully managed non-operatively also had a not inconsequential number of many of those things as well. We did logistic regression, looking at a whole variety of factors uh, uh, that might impact the risk of uh, infection after these, uh, uh, in these different groups. 
uh, and really never found a splenectomy to be a factor or a variable that fell out. Uh, certainly, uh, mechanical ventilation as a, a measure of respiratory failure or overall magnitude of injury certainly seemed to be. Uh, uh, ISS is a magnitude of injury, brain injury, the need for blood transfusions always uh, came out depending upon what model you used, uh, but we could never force uh, the actual splenectomy uh, to be a variable that uh, discriminated between infection or not, suggesting, uh, at least to us, that uh, when you're talking about doing a splenectomy in the multiply injured patients, uh, again, the, the splenectomy is a relatively minor factor in contributing to pneumonia, bacteremia, and urinary tract infection in most of those patients. So again, if you're, if you're trying to assess whether uh, <clears throat> your patient should undergo a splenectomy or not, fear of infection probably should not be at the top of the list. Uh, certainly, concern about bleeding should be at the top of the list. So again, as you can see, uh, more splenic injuries are being identified uh, over time. However, most of these are relatively low-grade injuries that are going to be uh, able to be managed non-operatively, whether you really knew about them or not. And so the number of really severe injuries largely has been fairly stable over time. Most of these low-grade injuries are associated with minor mechanisms of injury, very few other associated injuries, a bunch of factors that suggest that they're very good risk patients uh, for non-operative management. And so dissecting out uh, the very badly hurt person who falls out of that pattern is one of the tricks of the trade that the residents need to, you all need to learn about uh, when you are inundated with old person who fell with a minor injury, old person who fell with a minor injury over and over and over again. So patient selection uh, for non-operative management for the more severe injuries uh, is important. And it's important to keep in mind that, again, um, failure to diagnose bleeding, uh, failure to, to um, judge correctly can be associated uh, with increased morbidity and mortality. And that is something that we want to continue to try to refine uh, in terms of our decision making largely driven by what is going to be safe for the patient and in their best interests. And geography can be useful. Uh, we do utilize that periodically here at the University of Louisville. Uh, it's probably the exception and not the rule. Certainly using angiography as a tool to stop bleeding is fraught with a host of complications and problems. Using it as an adjunct to try to uh, finesse somebody that you're trying to manage non-operatively uh, will occasionally be prudent. Uh, I can't provide you any data that says that it is. Certainly routinely doing angiography on everybody does not seem to be worthwhile, but there are probably some uh, exceptions in which it does. Uh, and again, accumulating those uh, exceptions, you know, when they occur very infrequently is, is a challenge and a problem in the literature that the literature hasn't done a very good job of explaining. It is, no, uh, it is no doubt a stone-cold truth that splenectomy patients do suffer complications. However, the, the rate of those complications related to the splenectomy itself, left upper quadrant abscesses, pancreatic fistulae, things like that, is really wound infections and dehiscence is really fairly low and should be low. Uh, and it appears as if the role of associated injuries, the flail chest, the pelvic fracture, the uh, quadriplegia from the uh, cervical spine injury. All of those are probably more important factors in determining uh, morbidity and complications after a splenectomy in the group of patients undergoing splenectomy as a whole. And it's important to remember that people can still die of splenic injuries. Every once in a while we get a patient who comes in who's in terminal shock, uh, that if their splenic injury had been managed uh, faster or more rapidly or had been transported here more quickly, uh, that could have uh, improved their outcome. And so it's still important to recognize the bleeding, stop the bleeding. Uh, Dr. Richardson will make the point that uh, trauma centers were largely developed to identify and stop bleeding, and that's one thing that trauma surgeons can do. And that is still very relevant for the identification and management of uh, splenic injuries as a whole.
Well, that's a quick overview. Uh, hopefully that uh, filled in some of the gaps for the residents. Some of these topics we can spend an hour dissecting out and debating, and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions or take any questions if there are any. Brian, I thought that was great. Um, I, I just, my, my editorial comment is, I think trauma centers have done the greatest disservice in the world by, by um, screwing up the management of splenic injuries. It's the one thing we used to do, really be able to do fairly well. And uh, clearly non-operative management is important, but the, I think for people to realize that the point Brian made, and, and, and is very, very important in that East paper made, is that what when people talk about 90% success rate from non-operative management, which you see all the time quoted, oh, it's 80, 90, it's not, uh, near 100, it's whatever it is. That's after they've already taken off that 35, 40% that they've operated on. So to me, that's really important to, as a go forward. Uh, I just, if I can make a comment, I think the where embolization is good. We've had a couple of patients through the years who've had uh, coronary uh, heart attacks, MIs or whatever, driving to rupture their spleen. Those patients probably don't belong in the ER or OR rather. And, and that's what I remember a couple of those through the years where embolization might've been helpful. Uh, and then if you're gonna maybe have a catheter in place for a, for a liver injury or a pelvic fracture and all, and, and, and maybe an adjunctive splenic embolization might, might be good. So I had two questions to start, Brian. Would you discuss uh, your experience with splenic infarcts, and I've, I've had some terrible experiences with those, which people in that Han paper you quoted, it was a quarter of the patients had a splenic infarct. And, and to me, that's not a good outcome. So I, I, I wish you'd talk about it and, and, and whatnot. And then secondly, do you have an opinion or know of studies that in any way have looked at splenic function after you've embolized, especially the main splenic artery? So do you have any thoughts or data on that? I guess those would be my two questions. Right, well, to, to address the splenic infarct first, um, <clears throat> it's a little hard for me to know exactly how um, important those are. Uh, certainly, you can get an infarction after doing angiography and embolization. That's the intention of doing the procedure, is to stop the blood flow. Some of it uh, we didn't get into, but I mean, there's a whole difference between whether they try to do something super selective or whether they just try to decrease the pressure head of the splenic artery by doing a proximal main splenic artery, artery coiling. Uh, and so there are technical issues, which we didn't get into, that can potentially influence their risk of having uh, a splenic infarct uh, and uh, whether that becomes symptomatic. Every once in a while, we'll see folks on the service who have splenic infarcts from things like endocarditis or other types of things. Uh, again, some of them are asymptomatic, some of them are not. It's a difficult issue. With splenic, with respect to splenic function, uh, there probably is no fabulous work uh, that talks about <clears throat> uh, splenic function after embolization. Again, some of that depends upon the technique with respect to whether they're doing a very distal embolization or whether they're doing a proximal embolization. Uh, there's a reasonable body of literature uh, back from, I think it was the 50s or 60s, uh, where people were trying to do splenic artery embolization in cirrhotics to interfere with the splenomegaly that, and the hypersplenism that many cirrhotics developed as a consequence of their portal hypertension. And that always failed uh, because those patients basically recanalized their splenic arteries and got their splenic blood flow through collaterals uh, and so kept having hypersplenic function. And so uh, it, you know, depending upon what your technique is, the interruption of splenic function may not necessarily be permanent if those cirrhotics are a reasonable approximation of uh, other patients. Right. Dr. Bozeman, you have any, any questions or comments? Trying to get out, trying to get my uh, phone off mute. No, I think I think just like everything else that uh, Dr. Harbrook presents, that was pretty encyclopedic, and I agree that there's a wide range in management techniques depending on where you are, and whatever is new is not always better. And when angiography and embolization came about, 
Um, there were probably a lot of people that got embolized that would have done better in the operating room. And I think um, having some thought, having some um, expectation and relying more on how the patient's doing overall in terms of their tachycardia, abdominal pain, whether or not they need transfusions, and drawing a line in the sand and saying, all right, if, if we have to give this person any blood, despite what their spleen looks like on, on CT scan, we're going to the operating room. Because the people that get in trouble are the ones that are borderline, where you think, all right, we're going to put them in the ICU, we're going to watch this. You let their tachycardia worsen, you let their, their um, blood pressure drop a little bit, they start having some mental status changes and then you decide to operate on them and sometimes it's too late. So um, decisive decision-making is the most important thing uh, in splenic trauma. Good point. Uh, anybody else have a comment? Any Anybody that I'm not seeing? Dr. Polk, do you have anything you'd like to add, Hiram? Hey, Dr. Richardson, Nick Nash here. Can y'all hear me? Nick, yeah, thank you, Nick. Uh -huh. uh, no, no problem. Sorry, I've been in and out with uh, dealing with putting out fires on trauma this morning. But uh, Dr. Harbrick, for most of the talk that I caught, unbelievable as usual. And and the, the big comment I wanted to make, just adding that another patient population that may benefit from angiography uh, is the liver failure patient population where they have a little splenic lack, have horrible porter hypertension. Right. Uh, you don't want to necessarily do a, a big laparotomy and whatnot. That, that's another patient population you may want to add to the list, just like Dr. Richardson had commented on about uh, you're already going to be doing an embolization for a pelvis or uh, you got a patient with a horrible heart. So that's just something else to add. My only question for you, Dr. Harbrecht, that we, you know, when I was in California, they always wrote about infectious complications, infectious complications after doing splenectomy. Um, what do we kind of find in our series as far as, you know, did these patients have more urinary tract infections? Did they have more ventilator associated pneumonias after they had it, their spleen out? Uh, I think that's just an interesting thing to talk about because I think it gets overblown. And the second portion is, uh, second question is, you know, what do we tell these patients that have a splenectomy long term if they have a fever? You know, how, how should we counsel them in that? Right. Well, I, again, I, your, your mentor in California was the one who basically said that, that, the infectious complication rate was high after splenectomy and prompted our investigation. But in, in our patients, it really looked like uh, the, infect, the complications tracked the magnitude of injury and the associated injuries, not the splenectomy itself. And the people who had splenectomy for isolated splenic injuries uh, really had an extraordinarily low rate of infectious complications. With respect to patient management, um, again, we did not go into it, but post splenectomy infection uh, is a real phenomenon. It's also a very rare phenomenon, particularly when you're talking about adults who are having their spleens out uh, once their immune system is mature. And so, I mean, I, again, there are some occasional patients who will get bacteremia uh, and from the absence of their spleen. Um, Mainly those patients need to, again, uh, uh, seek medical attention very quickly. Uh, I, I personally do not tell people to keep a vial of penicillin in their refrigerator like uh, many <laughs> pediatric surgeons tell their patients to do. Uh, because, again, I think the uh, incidence of post splenectomy infection, particularly uh, in uh, 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 people who are being vaccinated post splenectomy, uh, is quite low. And oftentimes, uh, again, the bacteremias and pneumonias, again, in that population is oftentimes associated with other risk factors of people who are at risk for getting community-acquired pneumonia as well. They're homeless, their uh, uh, hygiene and health is not very good, and those types of things. So it's a tough question to answer. Great questions, great comments. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Brian, thank you for a wonderful and uh, really, as, as uh, Matt said, I think an encyclopedic talk. I mean, it was really, really good. I think the residents need to pay attention to these are not easy decisions, as, as Brian, I think, clearly indicated and, uh, and whatnot. But uh, when you get out and practice, though, there are chances. This is one of the few things that you really can do to occasionally really save a life. I, you know, just absolutely be able to do that and most halfway competent general surgeons should be able to do a good splenectomy so great talk we'll move on uh, who's who's doing m&m today <laughs>